But uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, it's exciting to see everybody here on campus. And actually, it's really exciting for me to have Steve here, too. So uh, actually, isn't this a great facility? Yeah. yeah. Um, actually, I started in 2007 here. I think uh, I think it's possible that that's it. 1997. Oh, or 1997. I don't know. Was okay. I not listening? I don't know. I've been here. I just completed my ninth year. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Uh, hey, they gave you that sheet to read. Right? <laughs> so, um, but uh, yeah, uh, I guess I was thinking I was going to do a brief introduction, but. Uh, that was kind of covered. But I think this idea of the uh, science business thing, I took it very seriously when I first came to Monmouth and actually even put in a proposal before I ever got here about doing an analytical chemistry lab next to a food science laboratory because uh, food and cooking and things like that are uh, essentially just doing chemistry at home. Uh, and we do have that nutrition lab back here in the corner, uh, excuse me, where the uh, coffee project uh, is housed and we roast our own coffee here on campus and I have science students who do that uh, and then I have business students who are account reps uh, and then I have some computer science people who have been trying to work behind the scenes in order to uh, develop the process um, and then I also have art uh, majors involved in that doing design and labels and things like that so uh, but, but uh, yeah I very much enjoyed this sort of science business connection that was started by Nord Ditzler when I got here who is the current president. So, uh, Steve, do you want to have any words of introduction for yourself? No. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really have nothing more to add. Uh, uh, I'm happy to be here. This was a very important place for me, Monmouth College. It's where I uh, uh, became a student. And, and uh, uh, in large part, the reason that I am who I am has to do with Well, and a lot of times, and again, uh, De Novo Beverage is, again, a small brewery. I think when it comes to craft breweries, what people say that uh, to sort of differentiate you from what we would call a macro brewery, meaning a large Anheuser-Busch or something like that, a lot of times you use the term craft brewer uh, or a micro brewer, uh, again, following the sort of the scientific of the, uh, the IU or the uh, international of measure, uh, the metric system, and talking about the uh, micro. And we like to say that we're sort of even smaller than that, so Pico is the next one down. <laughs> so, um, but actually, we started two years ago, and we were really, really small, like it's in 10 gallons, and now we've actually raised up to 50 gallons, a whopping 50 gallons of brew each time. And so we're kind of Pico squared, I think, is what we're doing. We're going to be micro. Yeah, or nano. Yeah, I guess you could go nano too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're getting closer to nano. So, Brett, that's that's fifty gallon each time you make a batch. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Each six hours, and actually, you have a handout here. We'll uh, talk about a couple of things on there, uh, just as a guide, and we'll we'll actually talk about that, Steve, in just a little bit. Um, so, uh, actually, a lot of times people ask us, how did Steve and I come together? Uh, well, like a good citizen, I go to the dentist, um, and uh, I had had some unfortunate uh, um, accident, and I knocked one of my front teeth out. Or no, you pulled my front tooth out. Yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah, and then somehow the other one came out too. I, I don't remember all the details. I'm surprised his wife still talks to me. <laughs> I think he was making business. He was, yeah. That's right, but yeah, I have two... Uh, Two new front teeth here, and I think when I first sat down in the chair, Steve and I were talking about uh, craft beer and how we were both home brewers, and uh, we said, "Oh, it'd be kind of neat if we just set up a little brewery in town." We said, "Oh, that'd be silly. Why would we want to do that?" I think after my second visit, we kind of both looked at each other and said, "Well, maybe not that's not so silly. I don't know. Yeah. Not quite as crazy as we thought." Yeah, uh, and then we uh, we chatted with a mutual friend who owned a restaurant here in town, and the agreement was to put uh, the brewery in her restaurant. And sadly, along the way, uh, she had some financial troubles, and, and the restaurant closed, and we ended up moving where we are now. Yeah, so, yeah, so 
couple of good front teeth, and now we have our very own craft brewery here in Monmouth, Illinois. So uh, we have very little competition from other craft brewers, by the way. Uh, <laughs> we're not certain if another one comes into town what we would do. We would probably welcome them, actually. I don't know. Uh, I think there's enough beer drink in this town. Not that it's a lot, necessarily. I don't know what the total is, but I think uh, our market share is probably sub-5%. Uh, yeah. So, that's right. So um, anyway, so let's just talk a little bit about the brewing process. Um, one of the reasons we like to do this, again, I, I kind of consider as an educator that uh, when people uh, have typically thought about wine, they think of wine as a more sophisticated beverage. Um, I would go toe to toe with anyone else who would like to say that wine is, is or the beer is any less sophisticated, actually. I think uh, beer has sort of had a very historical role in uh, many different processes that have gone on. And I think it's actually much more complex than wine is. When it comes to wine, it's about growing grapes. And so it's more of a biology in the plants than it is actually making the wine, the viticulture. Now there's actually a really uh, great skill in winemaking where you blend wines together. But actually blending wines together is one to not only uh, provide some sort of quality that that person wants in the beverage, but also to push for consistency. And actually as a small brewer, consistency is not really something that I shoot for. Uh, it, it's not necessarily a point that, that I say that's good or bad. We do try to keep the same process and the same ingredients the best we can, but on occasion we'll be using a slightly different grain or different hops or a different yeast or a different process because again, I'm a scientist, Steve is a scientist at heart, and we both are doing an experiment every time we make 50 gallons of beer. So, um, so anyway, so on this sheet here, uh, beer is a very simple product actually. There's only four things. There's water, there's barley or a grain, there's hops, and then there's yeast. And generally, a particular beer will have some sort of character that is influenced most by one of those four things. Now, generally, it's probably more of one of three things. Um, as, a, as a chemist, I think a lot about water. And it uh, turns out that depending on what ions are dissolved in the water, uh, if you've been drinking the water here in Monmouth, you realize that there's a lot of ions in Monmouth water. And you may not find that to be very palatable. Is this true? Uh, actually, if you live here, you kind of just get used to it. Uh, but actually, it's, re it's usually when you have an abrupt change in the water. When you drink water in your home and then you come and drink water somewhere else, it's very different that you can tell the difference more than actually what kind of flavors go along with that. But it turns out that all over the world, everybody was making beer. And if you lived in Czechoslovakia in the town of, say, Pilsen, Pilsen has very soft water, meaning there's no ions in that water, or very few. And so that style of water is best suited to do a light lager or a lager beer. And so things like the, the Budweiser or the Bud Lights or all of the light beers are essentially light lagers. You need to have water that has very, very few ions in there. If we tried to brew a lager with Monmouth water, it wouldn't be very good. Um, and so actually I like this story about the water because it's kind of like a natural selection process. And that somebody was making a hoppy beer in Czechoslovakia one time, <laughs> but it turns out you need very hard water in order to bring out the hop character in a beer. And so they made a hoppy beer, but it wasn't very good. And so they tended to focus on a particular beer that was best suited for the water that was available in that town. Uh, it's, not you, a mis it's also not a mistake that Coors has Rocky Mountain spring water. I mean, that's essentially rainwater that has very few ions in it. It's a nice light beer. St. Louis pulls their water out of the Mississippi River, which again is rainwater, has very few ions out of it. Uh, you know, so the major big breweries were, were housed close to a water supply that was suitable for the style of beer that they were brewing, which in the United States was almost always a, a clean lot. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and if you travel to, say, London, uh, Burton-on-Trent, uh, that river there has lots of vines in there. And so the pale ale and the IPA and things like that that are, are thought of as very uh, hop-focused beers uh, essentially have come from that particular region. So again, the name of our business is De Novo Beverage, and De Novo means from the beginning. So whenever we start beer, we start with reverse osmosis water, the cleanest water that we can find. And then depending on what kind of beer that we make, we start by adding in different salts. So we add gypsum or calcium chloride or magnesium sulfate, sodium chloride, sodium, uh, baking soda, table salt. Table salt, yeah. I mean, we do a lot of things in order to start from a very fundamental, just water, pure water, and then add these things into it to accentuate certain aspects of that particular style we're trying to make. So the, uh, the sort of the second thing when we uh, think about the process, you have water, and the second thing you would think about is the grain. Okay, so when you think about beer, you usually think about barley. Um, and so most of our beers are all barley, with the exception of we have some oats in a stout. Oh, we have some rye in our pale ale and our IPA. Uh, wheat. Yeah, oh yeah, and then wheat. That's the other one, right? <laughs> yeah. Grains. Yeah, actually, there's several grains. Well, um, and there's small percentage is what we small. call the grain bill, but yeah. I mean, with the exception of the wheat, you know, you're only looking at a few percent of, say, rye in the pale ale as, and 95%. Well, if, uh, if you've traveled to Germany, you might have also heard about Reinheitsgebot, which was the German purity law that uh, pretty much said that beer can only be made, made up of water, barley, and yeast, or sorry, hops. Three things, water, barley, and hops. And because that was in 1560 something or other, and they didn't know yeast was involved. So you have to have yeast, but it was a natural something that was added in there. But uh, there's a lot of uh, conversation about why you would have a purity law like that. And the one that I like is that if you decided to put wheat or some other grain in there, then it's not considered beer. You can tax it differently. <laughs> I think, yeah. The other argument that I heard had to do with food, that wheat is made from making bread. stories is the one that's usually the one I tell. <laughs> so, but yeah, so when it comes to the grains, uh, again, I, I'll try not to turn this into a chemistry lecture here, but uh, there's essentially what we call the base malts and specialty malts. And if you see on your sheet there, uh, at the very top, it'll say uh, base malts and specialty malts. So um, the base malts are essentially what make up the majority of the beer, as Steve said, sort of 90, 95% or whatever of a beer. Uh, but then the other grains that you add in are what give it a certain uh, like color, for instance. So like if you have a red ale, like we have a red ale, um, it has just a little bit of sort of roasted grains in there to give it that red color. Uh, there's really not much in there. A lot of times people drink with their eyes and they see a very dark, beer and they think, oh my gosh, motor oil. <coughs> no. Actually, I can make a beer very, very dark, but also very light. It just turns out that that's not a traditional style. If you're going to put dark grains in there, you make it motor oil. Or you make it Guinness. Uh, but Guinness is actually 4.5% alcohol. Uh, it's actually a very drinkable sort of table beer. So. Uh, Less calories than Coors Light. Less calories than Coors Light. Okay. Is that right? I don't know the calories. <laughs> All right, I'll take your word for it, okay. Yeah. Well, and, and we talked a lot about these other sort of, uh, we refer to them as adjuncts, things that you add to beer. Coors Light, in order to get the alcohol content up, they add rice. Um, now, rice is a perfectly fermentable grain, uh, but it turns out that uh, it's not very traditional, and it's 
It's also not very expensive, and it doesn't really add much to the beer except for alcohol. Well, sugars that then get converted to alcohol. Um, so sometimes craft brewers kind of poo-poo on, on these light beers where you use things like rice or corn. Uh, but we actually broke down, and Steve made a uh, cream stout. Cream ale. Cream ale, sorry. Yep, we're going to do that other one later. What yeah. does malt mean? Um, so malt is, if you take a grain that came right off the plant, and if you take it, and there's somebody called the maltster that we don't talk about very much, but they take it and put it into a room and germinate it. So it starts to sprout the, the seed, the root, and then the the little uh, plant part, and then after about three days, you throw it in a kiln and dry it. So that has been malted. The process of malting is to let it sprout. And what happens is if you, if you take a grain and try to chew on it, it's like a little <coughs> rock. But once you allow it to sprout, it kind of opens up a little bit and it starts to break down the inner endosperm of the seed, and then it gets much more uh, Crunchy. The other uh, thing that it does, I mean, a seed is about 95% of that seed is, is starch, which the seed uses as, as that's the food that it uses to start growing until uh, the, the thing comes up and turns up. green and you start getting yeah. photosynthesis, okay? <laughs> and so every seed, yeah. <laughs> uh, what's that? Cooling outside. Okay, there you go. Uh, <laughs> So the seed has to have a food store uh, to get it to the point where photosynthesis can start. Okay, we use that food store to make beer, and by the malting process, uh, not only does it soften the, the kernel of grain, but that seed starts to produce the enzymes that are going to break that starch down into sugar, and so they they start to germinate that seed. You have the maximum amount of enzymes that are present. Then they kill it. So we we get the grain at a point where if you mix it all up in the in a vat, there are enough enzymes to change that that starch into sugar, which we use to make the beer. Thank you. Um, and if you remember back in the day, malted milk, you know the the malt shops and those kinds of things, uh, they it has a distinct flavor. Uh, and the difference between a milkshake and a malt is that they throw a little bit of that malted sugar on. Sorry for not bringing samples. Uh, uh, yeah, well, they said that there'll be uh, some samples, uh, I guess, last night and maybe even they this were. evening. Yeah, people have yeah. been tasting uh, And sometimes we bring these grains along. But yeah, if you just add a little bit of a highly roasted grain into that 50 gallons, even a half a pound, it will add that color. Uh, but actually, more to like a brown ale, a lot of times brown ales are. Uh, malt focused. So if, if you have a beer that's very malt focused, uh, that has to do with sort of the specialty malts that we use that have the sugars that sometimes have been caramelized in a way that the yeast can't break down the sugars. And so it leaves sort of a sweetness in the beer. And so this is all about the cooking and the recipe formulation that goes on. Um, on your sheet here, I think I put uh, so if you have malty beers like a red ale or a porter or stout or Oktoberfest is another kind of beer that you might think of that is very focused on picking the right grains for this particular beer. Uh, and the, the other thing to consider, unlike wine, where there are a variety of different varieties of grapes and, and growing conditions and that kind of thing when you pick them, uh, beer is made with same stuff, whether you make Guinness or, uh, or Budweiser, essentially, it's made with the exact same grain. It's just how that grain is treated uh, and the mixture of, of different grains that you throw in the pot. Uh, but it's all the same species of grain. 
buy grain from the United States or from Germany or Belgium or England, uh, we can, Canada uh, has a pretty large collection of grain. Uh, and each one of those is a little bit different. So if we're going to make a Belgian beer, we want to get Belgian grain because there's some characters that, that will come from the grain. So. Uh, okay, so we got water, we've got our grain in here. Uh, then the next thing we would add is the hops. Uh, so the hops are a flower. Uh, they look kind of like leaves, uh, but they're a hop flower. And if you would uh, inspect them, which I wish I could have you all in the nutrition lab and have you under the microscope looking at all this sort of stuff like I would do with my students, but there's these little glands, they're called lupulin glands. And in the lupulin gland is where the uh, hop plant has packed all these wonderful things inside there. And so uh, you have to break apart those lupulin glands and add those into your beer. So uh, uh, I think you may have heard sort of the advertising things talking about things being triple hopped. I think Miller talks about having triple hopping. Uh, well, just about anybody who could use that as a marketing strategy because everybody triple hops. They're just the first <laughs> one that they decided to put it right out there and go triple hopping, right? Uh, but uh, there are strategies in hopping. Usually if you add hops very early in the process of making the beer, you get a bitterness. And usually that bitterness is something that you find in a pale ale or most frequently in something like an IPA, an India pale ale, that is very dry on the finish. Uh, malty beers are not dry on the finish, but a hoppy beer will be very dry on the finish. Um, if you add hops sort of in the middle of the process, then you're adding them for flavor. If you add them towards the very end of the brewing process, then you're adding them for aroma and flavor. Um, and there's a couple different strategies, strategies that we use in order to accentuate aroma uh, from the hop character. Uh, and that's the dry hopping. It's on the sheet. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but dry hopping is something that after the fermentation is done that we add more hops into the beer and that takes what are called the essential oils that are in that uh, plant material and leaves those behind and those a lot of times will have sort of a citrus aroma uh, and, and sort of add to that overall uh, perception of that particular beer. So again, hoppy beers tend to be focused on the hops I mean, they certainly have grain in them, but those grains, the specialty grains, are usually very light. Uh, actually, we like adding a little bit of rye into our pale ales because the rye has a little bit of a spicy character, and you serve it, it blends very well with the hop character. And so you, you sometimes think if you drink our pale ale or IPA that there's a lot of hops in there, and actually, it's about half hops and half rye. So just a little. <laughs> trick that uh, a brewer can do. Um, the fourth item on here, on the other side there on the right, is uh, yeast. So Saccharomyces cerevisia uh, is the genus species name for this yeast. Turns out, like Steve said, with grain, all yeast is kind of the same, except for there's slight different strains of yeast, and people work very hard to isolate and purify these and do genetic testing. <laughs> And other sorts of things that go along with that. Um, oftentimes people might ask us the difference between an ale and a lager, and the answer is really not a whole lot. Um, there's a lot of talk about top fermenting, bottom fermenting. Um, really the biggest difference is a lager can still carry out fermentation at very, very low temperatures. So if you put a beer in a cave where it's 45 degrees or so, pitched a lager yeast in there, it will keep uh, finding sugars and metabolizing those into ethanol and, and continue to evolve that beer. Whereas an ale strain of yeast generally is a little bit less tolerant to those colder temperatures and it will kind of fall asleep. Uh, so, uh, But uh, yeast is not the only microorganism that we have added into beer on occasion. Uh, we typically don't do any other microorganisms like, like lactobacillus. Um, there's a big craze now in the craft beer industry to do sour beers. 
and sour beers actually have lactobacillus introduced and that's lactic acid. Um, it's kind of like acetobacter or acetic acid, which is vinegar. So it's kind of like mixing vinegar into your beer and you may not like that. Um, when you drink the beer, you either like it or you don't like it. I mean, it's very clear. Um, actually, you, we could do a little tasting with you just to sort of help you to pick out different beers too because people generally like malty beers or hoppy beers and you'll tend to focus down one path or the other. So, so if nothing else comes out of tonight's talk, it's okay to go the same path every time, right? So, and if you like hoppy beers, ask for pale ales and IPAs. And if you like malty beers, uh, do things like red ales or amber ales. Um, those will uh, make you a little happier during your consumption of the alcohol. Uh, some of the beers that are, as I have on the sheet here, that are yeast dominated, uh, the one that we do is a German wheat beer. And the German wheat beer strain is, uh, is very unique in that some of the, you know, it sounds kind of bad, but the waste products of the yeast have some clove and banana aromas to them. So if you've been to Germany or had a very fresh wheat beer, you will find this, you're like, somebody put banana in there. Mm -hmm. Well, no, it's uh, isoamyl alcohol, and it's just one of the metabolism products of that particular strain of yeast. It's all the Saccharomyces still but it's just a slightly different yeast. The Belgians also tend to have some very strange yeast. They focus a lot on, uh, on yeast strains. And actually it was the, the monks, the Trappist monks, who really started doing a majority of brewing and sort of specializing some of these strains of beer. So. Uh, any questions about beer ingredients? Yeah. Yes, sir. How do you do that? So yeah, so a standard yeast can bring beer or can take a, a, a sugar solution, bring it up to about 10 to 12% alcohol. Uh, but generally beer is somewhere in the range of sort of four to six. Um, is that controlled by government also? Um, actually some governments, um, I, I started brewing, home brewing in North Carolina because in North Carolina you could not purchase an alcohol or a beer that was over 6%. And so, so it was a funny state law, but they were afraid of people drinking too much beer and getting drunk and actually led from domestic violence is what the senator told me. Uh, I reminded him you could go buy Mad Dog 2020, right? Mogan Davidson 2020 for 3.99 and 18%. And he says, well, but that's different. <laughs> yeah. How is that different? Yeah. So. How do you control? Yeah. So the way we control that is the amount of grain that we originally put in. So uh, for like our 50 gallons of beer, generally some of our beers that are maybe six and a half percent, uh, we'll put in maybe 115 pounds of grain. Uh, but for a four and a half percent alcohol beer, uh, like our stout. Uh, we might put in like 85 pounds of grain. So the grain is essentially the sugar, and the more or less sugar you add, the more or less alcohol you're gonna have in the final product. Thank um, you. But you know, that's a really, that's the straight, the, the easy answer. But there are certain ways of modifying the processing of the starches in the grain to leave behind some of these bigger chains of sugars that actually don't get fermented out that then give the beer body like in a stout, for instance. Um, and so there's all kinds of tricks that you play in order to get body into the beer versus alcohol content. Um, alcohol content is, is, from my perspective, is kind of a side point. I don't actually think about it in designing a recipe. Um, it's more of the body and whether I want it to be hop focused or malt focused. Uh, so, uh, yes, yeah, go. Two parts. One, first one's pretty easy. Um, second one, maybe not so much. The 
first part is, you know, I like, uh, I prefer like a porter, a brown, a stout. So what makes it a porter versus a brown versus a stout? All right. Then the second part of my question is, as a chemist doing this, now I understand your four knobs. Uh -huh. How do you stay focused to get anything done? Right? <laughs> I mean, you want to you know, yeah. dabble with this, dabble with this, dabble with this. Is that why you have a dentist on board? <laughs> <laughs> well, but as a good scientist, I only change one parameter at a time. Yeah. Right. So I have to do that. That's sort of built into the way I do things. So it, that's why our beers type tend to evolve over time. Yeah. That we change something or we do something. We yeah, let's not do that again. But are we going to not sell the product? Yeah. Well, it's not bad. It's just not what I want it to be, right? right? Or it might be better this way. Let's try this. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we have a lot of natural selection that happens in our brewery. <laughs> yeah. So when I buy your cream stout, um, it may be slightly different batch to batch. But it will be slightly yeah. different yeah. batch to batch. There's no may about it. Uh, yeah. And some of, some of that has to do with just the the brewing process is, in, is, is not always 100% consistent, and some of that has to do with the fact that uh, we change the recipes at will. Yeah. And let me just respond to that one, and I'll get to you, you guys in just a moment here. But there's a, so there's a group called the Beer Judge Certification Program, and I've gone through and done the testing on that, so I'm a recognized beer judge. But there's 81 different styles of beer. So like as Steve's mentioning here, there is a stout category, and there's actually five different kinds of stouts, like dry stouts, sweet stouts, imperial stouts, right? So there are all these different styles. Um, there's porters, that's a whole different stout or category, and then brown ales is a whole different category. So you just mentioned about 15 styles by mentioning those three headings. Um, but there's sort of some guidelines that, that talk about how you get to this particular beer. Um, it's softer than what the guidelines say, um, but if you're doing a stout, you technically cannot make a stout unless you use roasted barley. Now it's not malted, it's just roasted. And so there are these little rules that, that show up in this way. Brown ales also have a little bit of a yeast component to them, whereas porters, you want to use a standard sort of work workhorse ale yeast that doesn't really add any yeast character. Uh, and so, so that's a, a complicated question, uh, and I look forward to sharing more details at the at That's a wine shop. Right, yeah. So, that's um, good, thank you. Did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, a lot of these craft breweries we cover four, four main ingredients. But uh, I can go to a, a favorite craft brewery up, up in Michigan, and they've got about 20 different beers on tap, and uh, 15 of them are probably what I call foo foo beers because they have all these other uh, fruits and flavors and so on. Where do they come into the process? Well, uh, you can add other things. I mean, and most of, most of the time those are added late in the process. I mean, the fruit beers, the cherry stouts, the cherry, you know, and we tend to agree with you. Neither Brad nor myself are uh, real big fruit beer lovers. It uh, doesn't mean we won't brew one, but, but it does mean that, that if I'm going to the refrigerator, I'm not going to pull out a, a cherry wheat if there's a, if there's a good German wheat sitting next to it. There's only um, so many beers you can drink in. Right. <laughs> For me, it's about two, three. It's so, <laughs> in the usually, I mean, most of it is done in the fermenter. I mean, when when you get done uh, when you get done brewing the base beer, you, you, it gets put in the fermenter, and then you can you can add uh, uh, fruit if you want. You can add coffee. There are some you know coffee stouts and things, and actually coffee. And if they're done properly, uh, the, the beer stands on its own. And then the flavors from, from some of those adjuncts that are added uh, sort of filter in uh, as, a, as a secondary thing. Uh, sadly, a lot of places uh, put so much cherry or so much uh, of these other flavors in um, that that becomes the dominant flavor of the beer rather than the beer itself. Um, but as, as the craft beer has matured and has moved along, you're seeing much more of that. Uh, 
beers, for which I, I, don't, I guess I was late to the judging competition or something, but, but that's where you find your pepper beers. Um, you know, if you have a little jalapeno pepper in there. Uh, and you can put all sorts of things like sweet potato beer. Uh, but when you judge a beer like that, you, you're really judging it on the base beer. The person who submitted it has to tell you what is the base beer and then tell you whether they added coriander to it or sweet potato. And then so you say, what contribution did that sweet potato make to this beer? And the answer is usually not much at all because it'll get fermented out just like anything else, right? I mean, you don't have to use pumpkin in your pumpkin pie. It's just the spice, right? Pumpkin doesn't really taste like anything. It's a squash. Another added thing. Uh, hops was not the original flavoring for beer. I mean, hops has only been around for a few hundred years. Uh, the original uh, beer was brewed and they used uh, whatever they could pick out of their backyard. Rosemary, Heather, Heather. they called it Gruet instead of beer at that time. But, uh, <laughs> Gruet, G-R-U-I-T. Yeah. Uh, and if you search, if you go to Friar Tufts, you can probably or Vinnie's, or some Vinnie's. of these other big liquor stores. Uh, Question. So when you do your experiment, so you've been making an IPA, uh -huh. and then you do an experiment, and it doesn't taste like what you originally, you know, your line was running. Do you relabel the beer? Um, we have, and actually our original naming structure was Pale Ale Number One, <laughs> and yeah, and so, very easily add pale ale number two after we go through the, uh, you have to send all labels off to the federal government for approval. Uh, they have to prove your, the federal government approves your recipe and your label. The state of Illinois has nothing to do with that. Uh, that's all through a federal process. Uh, if it's significantly different, we would consider giving it a different name. Uh, I was just thinking if it's bad, Carbonated. We have we could control that totally. Uh, 
Um, so I guess we choose it to be slightly under carbonated. Um, we don't have the most professional bottling system. And so uh, maybe we don't hit our target every time. Uh, but yeah, there's some, some uh, inconsistency. But, but again, we're not huge fans of really highly carbonated beers. Um, each beer style has a certain optimum carbonation level. And so something like a stout really doesn't need to be carbonated much. A wheat beer tends to be the most carbonated of beers. Um, and so there might be some variation. If, if you continue your voyage in sampling, uh, uh, hopefully you'll find the one that fits your taste. But uh, Can you bottle it for that? How should we answer that? The, the bottle we, uh, we had, uh, when we first started, we had a couple of cases of those bottles. Uh, like 100, and we said, wow, that's a lot of bottles. And so that's the style that we had, so that we didn't have to buy them. Uh, it turns out 100 bottles is not very many bottles. <laughs> yeah. And we've had to buy thousands more. But that's kind of, that's, that's how we chose that style of bottles. And it turns out we kind of like it. They're easy, uh, they're easy to use in the bottling uh, thing. And uh, it's also fairly distinct. That's sturdy.
to UC Davis, they have a viticulture and ology okay. and uh, a brewing facility. That's, there's a uh, Anheuser Busch uh, endowed chair position. And when I asked them what they do with the product, they said, oh, we throw it away. Well, and it comes down to this. It's the tax on anything that has alcohol in it. The federal government, the state government wants your tax dollars for that. Yeah. So, so again, back to sort of that original question. Yes, I involve my students in my conversations, whether it's general chemistry and my physical chemistry class. Mm -hmm. there, is, there is frequent reference to the brewing process. It is a scientific process. The same things I would say about all this going on here is being used in the ethanol industry. And so a student who understands how to make beer could also then go work in the ethanol industry. So yeah, I usually don't pull back anything. I haven't been fired yet, but, uh, uh, but yeah, there is sort of a touchy line there uh, in that it might appear as though I'm promoting drinking. But actually, I'm, what I am doing is I'm promoting responsible drinking. And I think especially in this day and age of college students standing at the grocery store making a choice between a 30-pack of Keystone Light or a nice six-pack of, of Bent Rivers Uncommon Stout, I want them to buy that Uncommon Stout. I don't want them to abstain because they're not going to abstain. Right? I mean, they're just not going to do that. So I want them to be more responsible when they do that. And I think some of the conversations I have with students moves in that direction opposed to promoting alcohol consumption. Wait, I, I think one of the things that, that drinking beer with no taste does is it promotes over drinking. Uh, I mean, you're, you need to choose a beer based on flavor, based on something that you enjoy drinking, the same way that you might choose an applesauce or, or anything else, or any other type of dish that you might and that promotes responsibility. You know, the alcohol is a side effect to it. it in some ways, it's a bit unfortunate that it's there, but it is. And, uh, uh, you know, craft beer actually works very hard at being responsible. And I think people that drink craft beer tend to be responsible. The, the, uh, the, the macro beer drinkers are the ones that are responsible. You, you talked about selling through market out of wines uh, through bottling, but I know that you sell through other, you have other outlets, but it may not be through the bottle, if you, but you do have other outlets in the community. So I'd like you to talk about them. The second thing is what is your, and I know you're almost like a non-profit, right? I mean, you're just trying to, <laughs> but, but, is it yeah. but, uh, but what's your best, what's been your best seller since you're well, we sell, uh, we've got four or five other taverns that, uh, that sell our beer. Uh, Danny's uh, probably has the most. Bijou's got some. Um, Legion has some on occasion. Uh, Petey's sells, has, has got a handle there most of the time. Uh, and then Fat Fish over in Galesburg uh, are the, the venues right now. Uh, probably the IPA is probably your biggest seller. Sell more IPA than anything in the red. Is Stout's pretty good too. Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah. <laughs> probably probably. Yeah, probably. probably. We probably yeah. sell more of that than, yeah. than we do anything else. Yeah. That's kind of the, the, the end beer right now. That's right. Is, yes. Is there a, like a question about what is the different ions in the back to water? Yeah. Uh, that's not just least ground elements or compounds. Is it? What, what is the term? Yeah, well, it's more of a geology kind of thing of where the water uh, contacts as it passes from rain down into the ground. I mean, Monmouth water is extremely old water, meaning that the wells are like 2,000 feet deep. So by the time the water has percolated through the whole system down to the, where these wells are, you've had a lot of exposure to different ions, and so there's opportunity for things to dissolve in that water. Um, you know, if you're getting rainwater, Actually, there's, you're really not coming in contact much with ions, but you gotta have some percolation to get down to an aquifer so that you kind of clean out you know, the shoes and leftover 
socks that came out of the Mississippi River, I guess. Uh, but, but yeah, it's, it's really just a lot of geology um, of what ions show up. And we, we're actually purchasing a new piece of equipment on the chemistry that can determine all those ion concentrations. So I'm pretty excited about doing that for a number of environmental reasons as well as looking at beer. Um, well, Hannah Maher has given me the whoop, whoop, whoop. So we got to wrap up. Steve Merman, Brad Sturgeon. Thank you.